All right, JoeyRitter.com, Joey Ritter on Twitter. Excited about my guest today. I got Dave Basella. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, you are a writer, a podcaster, a stand-up comedian, an animator, an actor, and a father. That's a yeah. lot of things, Dave. Yeah, I like to keep busy. You told me that you've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and you've got a son on the way in a couple weeks. Yeah. My question to you, Dave, uh, how does you know your wife let you do all the things that you do? Uh, I, I, I pick and choose very carefully. Like, I don't... She lets me... She gives me a lot of leeway, but I don't take advantage of it. Do you have to kind of uh, cash chips in, you know, like maybe do three days in a row with the kids and then, and then say, okay, Thursday's my podcasting day? Kind of. I usually try to do... Uh, get all my recording done in a day or two so that I have the rest of the week. So, All right, so you got the Eric and Dave podcast. Now, Eric is spelled with a K. We yeah. should, uh, we should uh, say that. Now, uh, what's the web URL that people can listen to that at? Uh, that's at ericanddave.com, just Eric with a K. Uh show's called Eric and Dave Talking with Eric and Dave. Cool. It's pretty silly. It's yeah. just ridiculous. I started listening this week. I like it a lot. It gives me something new Thanks. to listen to at work. Um, so, you know, as you've been a father for the last three years, right, um, I've seen some of the work that you've done, all right, and, you know, let's just say that, you know, I, I don't know if maybe you want, when they turn eight years old, for them to see when they finally start understanding curse words and, and drug references, is that something you keep in the back of your head, or are you just kind of like, whatever? Uh, not really. Cause, I mean, there is stuff I want to do that they can uh, they can watch or take part in. Okay. And I, I'm working on it, but then I also got to do what I'm comfortable with and what I feel like I'm good at, right. which sometimes isn't the cleanest. So uh, they're not going to watch everything. I don't expect them when they're nine to be asking me to watch Juggle Ohio. So uh, I, I don't mind it. <clears throat> I mean, like I said, I, I do want to do something that I can watch with them at some point but right now they're not even really old enough to watch anything anyway so uh, I to- get away I with it for a while i understand that right now it's not a concern but you know you up, uh, upload things on the internet and they oh they kinda, stay forever they, yeah. they stay forever and eventually they're going to be smart enough to search you out and see what you've done you know in the past and then you know, when you're trying to yell at them for doing something, they might say, oh, okay, well, hey, maybe uh, you shouldn't have painted your face all the time. And <laughs> Well, I, the, the approach up with them is just, uh, as long as you understand why the words are bad or why the drug references are bad, I don't mind if they're exposed to them, as long as they understand why they're bad. And, like, they're already, the three-year-old loves zombies. Okay. Like, she loves anything with zombies on it. So she's already smart enough to establish reality and what's on TV and stuff. So uh, I don't mind that because I think my kids are going to be smart enough to separate the two. Okay. So you mentioned Juggle Ohio. Um, Tell everybody what that is. Uh, It's just a web series that myself and Tony Hartman created, wrote, directed, produced, starred in. Uh, It's just a little six-episode, little miniature sitcom that's on the Internet. Uh, about a guy who's dealing with his professional office life and his pot dealing juggalo roommates. <laughs> so, uh, so I've seen it, I've seen a couple episodes now. Um, the office worker he's not involved in the pot dealing, right? He just is kind of no. Around. He is. He, he is, is, but he's trying to. Uh, the business goes on without him, and he's been so preoccupied with work that he doesn't take as big a part as he used to. Okay, but he's still. They still kind of look to him. Uh, he's still kind of their leader because for as long as they've known, he's been like the 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 leader and the one they look to. So uh, they feel like they might be losing him, but he's still there. So they're still uh, trying to look to him to see what to do. Right. I just I can't help but I I have this. I wanted to record tonight, but it didn't dawn on me. I don't ever have this mustache. <laughs> this, this is for a film for something we're filming in the morning. And it didn't dawn on me until I said we'd record tonight. It's like, crap, I'm going to have this mustache. Because <laughs> up until about 20 minutes ago, it was a full beard. 
that I was growing out just so I could have the mustache. It's like, I'm going to have this stupid mustache. You know what? With the whole, it, you're a little grainy than, than some of my other interviews. The mustache kind of works with the graininess. Okay. It's right? just, but I, yeah, it's gone in the morning. We're filming in the morning, and then by like 8 o'clock, it's going to be gone. Um, what's your favorite Tom Hanks movie? Uh, Road to Perdition. Really? I never oh, saw yeah. that one. Huh? I never saw that one. Oh, it's it's good. It's it's darker than what he usually does, and it's just uh, Jude Law's amazing in it. It's a really awesome story. It's so well directed by Sam Mendes. It's it's awesome. It's a really good movie. Right. I know that's probably an out there choice for favorite Tom Hanks movie, but it's so good. Well, my my choice for favorite Tom Hanks movie, and I'm a hundred percent serious, is The Money Pit. Out of all the movies that guy's done, you know, that's the movie that I've watched the most and, you know, can quote any line from and love his performance in that movie. So, you know, I sound like Mr. Obscure, too, when I that's, say that. No, that's Meg Ryan, right? Was that the co-star of that? No, that was uh, Shelley Long. That's, that's it, Shelley Long. I get them mixed up. Yeah, Shelley Long. Now, I remember The Burbs is underrated, too. The, the Burbs, Burbs gets a lot great. of crap. People try to put The Burbs in there with Joe versus the Volcano. Joe vs. Well, Volcano is great as well. But the thing about Joe vs. Volcano is the the first, like, 45 minutes are brilliant, and then it kind of trails off a little bit. I never quite make it to the end of the movie, but the first 45 minutes of that movie are awesome. That's like a lot of uh, 80s, 90s movies, because, um, like, Ishtar gets a lot of crap for being terrible. Uh-huh. But the first... The first, everything that's not in the desert is brilliant. It's I, so good. This guy that I work with told you know recommended that movie to me, and he's you know he said it was kind of like the best worst movie of all time. And I I remember searching for it on like Netflix and Blockbuster, and they didn't have it even available to rent. So I've never seen it, but I tried to. It's like one of the biggest bombs in history, just because uh, Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty were so huge at the time, but. It, it, everything not in the desert is so good, right. but everything in the desert is so bad. All right, so yeah. as I, I said, as I said before, I you know I listen to the Eric and Dave podcast. Okay, um, so I've only listened to a couple episodes, but I kind of scrolled down and looked at your show recaps, and I saw one where it said uh, you were talking about jalapeno poppers. Yeah. What you know? How, how do you talk about poppers? I don't know how we talked about. It. I don't know how we talk about anything on that show, and I don't really know that we talk about it until I listen back to it. But uh, I think I had. Oh, I had eaten a jalapeno popper, but it was. Uh, it wasn't a full jalapeno inside. It was filled with cream cheese with chopped up jalapeno in it. So like a mixture. So you weren't biting into a full pe- popper. So I just had to add, I, I brought up brought it up to Eric to see if he'd ever eaten it like that, and then we just talked about that. And mo- the thing with the episode descriptions is I usually type them up right after we're done, okay. and I have no idea what we talked about, so it's really just me getting the audio file and then just picking at random spots, and then just like, oh, that's what this sentence was about. So I'll just put it in the description. And we may only say one sentence about it. Like, I think we only talked right. about jalapeno poppers for two or three minutes, but it was one of the random two or three minutes I listened to and recap. So so how do you guys prepare for your podcast then? Oh, we don't. You just <laughs> we, hit record and go? Um, occasionally, well, we have to write the fan fiction. That, that's, that's like the, the crux of the show is we write Battlestar Galactica fan fiction. Uh, even is though neither of us, I'm sorry, I, I'm not to cut you off, but was that what you you were reading a passage from, in in like the latest episode? You were re- you read a long passage. It's usually the last twenty minutes of the show is uh, reading fan fiction. Okay. Because we we write we, neither of us have seen Battlestar Galactic fan fiction, but it was a throwaway line in the first episode where I was just joking. I said, "Oh, if you let us know, you listen to this episode." We'll write you into a Battlestar Galactic fan fiction, and I wasn't serious. But then Eric's like, "I'll write it." I was like, "All right." So what we just started doing was, one of us writes the beginning of a story, and the other one writes the ending, and we just go every week, just rotating, and uh, we just name characters after people we know that listen to the show, okay. and uh, it gets pretty ridiculous. But um, 
That's a good way to keep fans engaged, though. Yeah, and we do that, and... I mean, we have stupid segments. Uh, most of our preparation is just writing stuff on index cards and just reading, and just just discussion things, really. Like, there's really not much. It's just, he gets here, and I say, oh, did you prepare any segments? And if he says no, it's like, well, I kind of have one. And there's no pre-planning. It's just, sometimes he'll come, and he has a segment, and I don't. Sometimes I have one, he doesn't. On the rare cases, we both do. Sometimes we push it back, but... It's a mess. It really is. And it's a weekly podcast, right? Yes, we do it every week. Yeah, that's why, that's, that's why I'm trying to make this show you know, a weekly thing. And it's like hard enough to nail down a guest and, and get questions. And you know, I should say that you were kind of a last-minute booking because um, I had a, a guest that, you know, for one, you blamed it on uh, Internet connection. You asked me like 12 hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> and you were ready to go. Yeah. I like talking. I know. It's great stuff. Um so, out of uh, any movie that was based around a Saturday Night Live character, what do you think was the best one? I liked Ladies Man. Really? I, I, I love the character. I love Tim Meadows. Uh, I, I don't know if this is the right term for him because he was there for so long. I think he's incredibly underrated. because oh, he, yeah. was, he was so underused and he was there for so long. Um, that's probably the best... Uh, or Wayne's World. Wayne, oh, Wayne's, yeah, World Wayne's World too. Wayne's World is definitely mine. But now let's go back to Tim Meadows because when he first was on the show in '92, you know he's with Dana Carvey and Mike Myers and Phil Hartman and and Chris Farley and all these you know Adam Sandler these breakout huge superstars and he was never in any skits and then finally you know all those guys you know i mentioned leave the show and finally he got to get his characters in and you saw how brilliant he actually was yeah and i mean it happened kind of with look how long tracy morgan was on there without really getting featured ever Uh uh-huh and then he actually really didn't kind of blow up until after it with 30 rock but it's just it's fun to see those guys stay for so long and never really break Right. Then you have the other side where there's guys that are featured and still stay way too long, like Fred Har- Armisen. Like, he just stuck around forever, and he was, like, featured from day one. But uh, Sarah Silverman was also somebody who was featured for so long but never really got, you know, a, a reoccurring character on the show. But then when she, you know, when she left the show, she gets huge. Was she on SNL? She was, like, uh, that early 90s time period. See, I remember her, the first time I saw her was Mr. Show. Okay. Yeah, and, Mr. Uh, that, that was mid-90s, yeah. Miss, Mr. Show, that's that's one that passed me by. I'm, I'm, de- I'm definitely a huge David Cross fan, but I have not seen Mr. Show. Mr. Show in the state uh, is where I got my sense of humor from. Okay. Like, those two shows, I can't pick one over the other, because they are so huge to like my writing style, my stand up style, what I think is funny because they they both of them did what they wanted to do. The state I am totally with you on. I've I I've seen just about every episode of that. Then watch Mr. Show because I can't imagine you not enjoying it. Okay. It's the same kind of just we don't care. We're doing what we think is funny. If you do too, great. If not, we're still making ourselves laugh. It's the same approach. And it's so good. The state was so ahead of its time. I mean, I, I don't. I think it did poorly. I guess when it when it was actually aired, and then you know it got a cult following, obviously. And and there was that whole thing with the DVD release. It um, did okay. The whole thing with that was, um, some of the members got greedy because MTV would have kept it going. MTV, I think, ordered. It was a large amount of episodes. They would have renewed them for like 40 more episodes, but CBS came calling and willing to pay so much more money that they're 24, 25 at the time. Right. So they took this network money, had one special, and then got canceled. <laughs> and then, Really? Yeah. So, I mean, it, they could have stuck around at MTV for a long time. And it's interesting because would they have grown the same cult following if they did? Uh, or would they have kind of run themselves into the ground? But I think they'd have stayed great because 
even now, every one of them are doing stuff that I enjoy. So, so did you see that CBS episode? Uh, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a grainy VHS copy of it because I taped it. Uh, I taped it when it was on, but I think I lost my tape. And then I have one of my buddies has made copies upon copies of it because friends keep losing it. So I have like a copy of a copy of a copy. Hey. It was it was good, but it was on network television and sketch comedy doesn't have a good track record in prime time. Do you, on... me- Do you remember some of your favorite state characters? Um, I didn't like a lot of the, I liked old timey guy, uh, Thomas Lennon. Was that the call me old fashioned guy? Yeah. Yeah. I liked him. I didn't like a lot of the, the recurring, I'm, I generally am not drawn to recurring characters. Uh huh. I like one off things. Uh, so, like, Goodbye Mailbox is good. Oh, that's a great one. That's one of the best. Uh, that's the one with the tacos, right? Yeah, the Taco Mailman. Uh, the one with the hormones when they're about to... The two teenagers are getting ready. That was an early one, yeah. That was one of the very, very first ones. The monkeys do not do it. They make love. Like, right. that's... that's a, I mean, there's so many of them. I could list... I could name every sketch that I... And they're all my favorite. Like, it's hard to... The the skit that got me into watching the show for life was, um, it was one where there was a it was a burger joint and um, I forget yeah I get, it was Ben who was behind the counter. Oh and, God, yelling! Yeah, Joe comes in and orders a burger. He's like, Carl, <laughs> get me a chicken sandwich for crying out loud. Carl. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's that, good. You know, I think I was in seventh grade at the time, and my seventh grade sense of humor was exactly that. One of the best, I don't know why I love it so much, but there was a a commercial, a, a fake commercial for uh, a CD that was just sitting on a dock of the bay over, oh, yeah, yeah, over yeah. and it's just them on the phone being like, oh, it includes such hits as sitting on the dock of the bay, and just, it's like a minute and a half of just that, it's just so <laughs> funny. But see, the... Um... The, the brilliance of that is they did it a couple times in the episode. Like, when we come back yes. from commercial, it'll be like... See, I do like that. I don't necessarily like recurring stuff, like recurring characters, but I love I, I love a good callback, and I love a continuation thing. Uh, I love something that starts at the beginning, hits in the middle, and then wraps up at the end, like, with all the stuff in between. So, I... And watch... Seriously, watch Mr. Show, because they go... It was HBO, so no commercials... Uh-huh. And they go from sketch to sketch to sketch. Like, there's rarely a break between sketches. Like, one sketch ends, and it goes right into the beginning of the next one. Like It's brilliant. It's they, so good. Did they do that in front of an audience, or was it... Uh, a lot audience? of it was. Like, uh, the introductions were uh, done in front of, like, a restaurant-type setting. It's a weird setup. Very unique. And uh, they did some live stuff, but most of it was pre-taped. But they were there. Bob and David hosted, and they would get between clips sometimes. It was so good. But like right Paul F. Tompkins was on it, Sarah Silverman, Jack Black. Uh, oh wow! Just, yeah, yeah. So many people on it. That, I mean, and like Sarah Silverman was in it occasionally. She had a lot of good stuff. Jack Black, not as much, but his stuff was really good. I'd like to see some early Jack Black because, you know, I, I still like him, but I'm not really, you know, a fan of, of the movies he does these days. But I remember, remember that movie Airborne? Oh, with, that, with that? That took place in Ohio, actually. Yeah, that wasn't Christian Slater. It was around, I forget who was in that one. I don't know who That's... the main actor was, but Jack Black was in it, Seth Green was in it. Yeah. And it was just that rollerblading movie that's, you know. Because it was about the same time as Gleaming the Cube. Not, I don't know Gleaming the Cube. You don't know? Oh. That was, uh, well, I used to run a music website, and any band that would come through, we'd ask them ten questions. And one of the questions was, uh, which, what's the best Christian Slater movie? And if they didn't say Gleaming the Cube or Pump Up the Volume, we told them they were wrong. Okay. Like, that was just, those were the only two right answers. Best, best Christian, Christian Slater, Slater movie, I don't even know what I would say. I'd probably say Pump Up the Volume, because that's probably the first one I would think of. So good. But you know what? I, I would say The Wizard with Fred Savage. Yeah. I, it doesn't compare to Pump Up the Volume. That would Pump, be so awesome. Pump Up the Volume was a little too serious for me. I mean, I, 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 I was, you know, I think I was in like fifth grade when that came out. And, you know, the suicides thing, that was, that was a little heavy for me. 
I wanted to laugh, you know? I like Heavy. I still laughed a lot, because he's just... I, I thought Christian Slater was so good in that movie. What was the plot of that? He, he just was a radio DJ that... Uh, his dad was, like, head of the school board, and he was a radio... He was pirating radio out of his basement, and he became this big persona, and uh, uh, a girl killed herself after calling into a show, and they blamed him, and then they he became looked at like this leader of a revolution, like the school system was uh, doing shady stuff, and they like, kind of looked to him to lead this charge to change stuff, and it was really good. I might really have to go good. back now with that in mind, because that's totally not what I thought it was about. But, uh, okay, so we do a crazy segment here on uh, JoeyRitter.com called Turn It Off or Turn It Up, all right? all right? Basically, I name five songs, and you simply tell me if you turn it up or turn it off. Sound simple? Right. Yeah, that's simple. That's easy enough. And if I do not agree with your answer, I might jump in and argue with you. All right. All right, so your first song is Like a Prayer by Madonna. Turn it up. Of course you would. I, yeah. I, agree with that. I don't really like Madonna. That's one of the few... That's probably one of the two or three songs I actually like. That song kind of grabs you in, you know, it's got a slow building verse and then the chorus is good and then it just kind of keeps you going, the whole song. It's like Rocky Like a Hurricane by the Scorpions, where it starts and you're like, this sucks. And then the <laughs> chorus comes, it's like, this is the best song I've ever heard. <laughs> and then the chorus, the verse comes, it's like, what? Why was I excited? Then the chorus comes back, it's like, this is the best song I've ever heard. <laughs> That's pretty much like a prayer also. Yeah, there's a there's actually a Van Halen song that's exactly like that. Um, are you a Van Halen fan at all? Not at all. Okay, well, so you definitely wouldn't be interested in listening to this one because this is the one album they released with Gary Sharon. That's who, the only one I like. You, that's the oh only, my god. That's how anti Van Halen I am. That's the only album I actually somewhat enjoyed was the Gary Sharon. How album. How did you get into that album? I think out of spite because I hate Sammy Hagar and I hate David Lee Roth so much. That it's like, you know what? I hate those guys, so I'll just listen to the other guy. And it actually wasn't bad. Ah, oh, oh, man. Because I, I don't like Extreme either. So, like, there was no reason for me to listen to that album. But So, why do you hate David Lee Roth? I just don't like either one of them. I don't know why. I just. As in, like, you it's... wouldn't want to have lunch with them, or just be. Oh, like, you absolutely. hate everything they represent? Probably a little bit of everything. I, I just I remember every time the hot for school te the hot for teacher video would come on when I'm like five or six I would watch it and think like I hate that guy and then it's just like built that way and then uh, right now came out and like it was the stupidest video I'd ever seen and it's like I hate that guy too <laughs> so it's just like I don't know if I could justify him I just I just I don't I just hate him. Both. But was Sammy Hagar even in the Right Now video? I thought that was just clips of like... Oh, but he sang it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, think, I, get, I think it's because I got into David Lee Roth and Van Halen in my teenage years. So, um, I don't know. I just, like, when Howard Stern went off the air, um, I don't know if this was in markets in Ohio, but David Lee Roth basically took over for Howard Stern. And I think I was probably the only, me and like five other people in the country were the only people that listened to this radio show and, and were into it. It was so bad, but I couldn't, it, it's just like watching, you know, when someone tells you not to look and you look anyway, it's that same kind of thing. Like he would just regurgitate and say these things and he had to fill four hours a day and he just ran out of stories like his first two weeks on the air and then it was just pure nonsense and i just loved every second of it see i, I just don't like him at all <laughs> all but, right all right hey, well, let's move on to the next one uh i got cotton eye joe oh turn it off turn it off not a turn it off and leave me alone what about I, not even when they play it at sports games and stuff and get uh -uh. get the fans into it hate that song hate it got it all right your next one is Just Dance by Lady Gaga. I don't know that I... I don't... Just, I don't. I can't distinguish her songs. So I guess Turn It Up? That was one of her... Uh, I think that was her first breakout song. Uh, see, they're all, they're all like... I, they're, I guess Turn It Up, because I like some of her stuff. Yeah. Well, she's really... You know, she writes her own stuff, and, you know, she, she can sit down at a piano and make the 
the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And she's know? a genius. She's right. a, a, just a genius for everything she created. I started to like her a lot more when she would open up and like there was actually Stephanie and Lady Gaga. Like when she would, when she did that sixty minutes interview, like as herself, I grew like a whole new respect for her. Plus, I like what she does for the LGBT community and everything. So, yeah. like, I, I, a lot of people hate her. I don't. I think she's hard to hate. I really do. Well, it's, it's easy to hate her because people just see, you know, with the meat dress and that whole thing. Like, that's what they see. They don't take the time to realize what she's all about. And you know, they think just because she sings pop songs and it's kind of bubblegummy kind of stuff that she, there's not actual talent there. But you know, that's where people. She's just, yeah, she's right. that. She's one of the ones that does have talent, like a lot of it. So. Right. All right. So, how about "One Week" by Bare Naked Ladies? Turn it up. Good tune. I like that album. The whole I, album oh, is good. Al- yeah, that album is great. That is that is an album you can listen to from start to finish. I saw them tour for that album, and it was one of the coolest. They played for so long. They played for like two hours. It was awesome. Yeah. That's that's a band that passed me by, but I remember being in high school and people going to see that concert and just talking about it how like how much of an event it was. I, that's that's what turned. It was just like it was cool. I'm not even a big big fan, mm-hmm. but like that song, I have a lot of memories too. In that era, like that summer, was an awesome summer. So I turn it up big right. time. And the last one is 500 Miles by the Proclaimers. Oh no, turn it off. That's even worse than Cotton Eye Joe. Oh my God! Now see. I, I hate that song. I, that's why I do this because uh, you know I, I would figure that's a shoe in for a turn it up. No, I love the movie it's from, but uh, hate hate that song. Any specific reason or just you know you're not into the melody? <sighs> that's another one that I I have stuff that I hated when I was younger, and I was young so I didn't have to justify why I hated something, so I just hated it, and I've hated it for so long. That's probably one of those. Because when that came out, my brother would listen to it over and over and over again. And I just hated it. See, but Dave, I'm telling you, it feels good to just, you know, the, the songs that you hated for no reason and the bands that you hated for no reason, to just later in life say, hey, you know what, there was no reason why I hated it back in the day. Yeah, I guess I could listen to and it And I now. try to sometimes. My girlfriend and I argue about pork chops a lot. Because she always says... I'm going to make pork chops, and it's like, yeah, I don't like pork chops. Because when I grew up, my mom made the driest, grossest pork chops. And every New Year's Day, I wasn't allowed to do anything until I ate my pork chops. <laughs> and her pork chops were so gross. My girlfriends are really, really good, but I still, when I hear pork chops, I associate with pork chops growing up. So if somebody asks if I like pork chops, I hate pork chops. But yeah, if my girlfriends cook them, I eat them, and I love them. But it's just... I am so used to hating them that I, even if I don't hate them anymore, that's just how I say. Like, Proclaimers, I might, Cotton Eye Joe, it doesn't, Cotton Eye Joe, I know I still hate. Yeah, well, that was just a good... I might like. You know a song I'll never like is Life is a Highway. Really? That's, oh, I hate that song. That, that reminds me of being at summer camp when I was in, like, uh, fourth grade or something. I think there was a kid in my school that, that was, like, is learn how to play guitar song. So anytime there was a party, he would have to play <laughs> Life is a Highway. And nobody liked it, but he would play it like three or four times. So I think I associate that with it. What what now that that's a good uh that's a good question though. Is there a, a song that, you know, I don't know what instrument do you play? Uh I play bass in a band. I do a little guitar. All right. Well, bass. okay. So let's say if you had your choice you're the guy with the guitar at the party. What song are you playing to get everybody into it? Radio by Alkaline Trio. Oh, come on. And everybody just knows the words to that one? No, I don't care. I'll enjoy it. My right. friends, yes. My friends, uh, my friends, uh, the champions of all time, they were an awesome Youngstown band that broke up years ago. They would cover that at shows occasionally. The place would go nuts. Oh, yeah. Like, if you're in a room of people that know that song, there's no better song to play in the world. That, that song is, is awesome. That's an incredible sing-along song. That's if it's not that, though, obviously Santa Ria. That's the only... Or yeah, Hey Soul yeah. Sister. Cannot go wrong with uh, any Sublime. <laughs> Soul Sister, that's kind of like the same chords with that song. <laughs> I know. No, I, those two were like the... 
like I like that Hey Soul Sister came and kind of became the the Santeria, like the the sublime guy at a frat party playing guitar. You got to hand it to Train though, and I mentioned this on a, on an interview I just did. Train was definitely like a band that I hated, you know, when they were when they first came out. But as I grew up, as my music taste kind of was, you know, evolved from just punk rock, I, I, you know, Train is a brilliant band. Like, they write legitimately good songs. Like I'm the opposite. I liked early Train. But as I get older and they get older, I hate Train more with every release. Well, they're starting to sound very, you know, commercial now. Like, you can't really tell the difference between the new Train song and the they're new They're very movement. manufactured now. Right, but at the same time, the fact that they can, I don't know, stick around in 2012 makes me listen to those songs from the early 90s. Oh, no, I respect them, but, like, I like the early stuff a lot. I don't really like like what they're doing now, cause right. they, but, but they know what they're appealing to, and I'll never, I'll never rip anybody for finding a formula and just milking it. I think Everclear is the number one band for finding a formula and sticking to it. Because every single Everclear song is just like, now. Dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun, yeah, dun, dun. I mean, his voice is so unique, though, that it'd be hard. Well, I say that, but then you look at Rain Mata from uh, Our Lady Peace, whose voice is so unique, but I don't think they ever sounded the same. So I'm kind of canceling out my own argument in defense of Everclear, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not against Everclear. I love Everclear, but it, but you know when I was start, starting to learn guitar, and you're like, hey, wait a second, he plays the same <laughs> chord in this song too. Yeah, no, and that, nobody gives not. a crap when you try to tell them, like you know, you try to pass off that you know the guitar part, but the average person could care less. They just want to listen to music. You're like, no, he uses the same G chord. It's not uh-huh. right. He shouldn't be doing that. I mean, look at Nickelback. They write the same... Every song is the same structure exactly. Like right. They've always been like that. I'm going to admit something to you that I don't want to admit. Don't right? say you like Nickelback. I'm, I'm not saying that. I, I got two stories for you, and they're both fairly quick. Um, I, I saw Nickelback live. Oh, my God. And it's because my now wife, girlfriend at the time... Her two favorite bands were, oh god, uh, Breaking Benjamin and oh. and uh, uh, what was the other one? It's not Our Lady Peace is getting me confused. It was a, 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 a Dima. It was another band that had one. I, I can't think of it, but it was it was something like Our Lady Peace, but not them at all. Um, but just as bad as like Nickelback. Um, damn it! I, I don't, now I'm thinking of Seven Mary Three, but it wasn't them. Um, anyway. So those were two her, her two favorite bands. So I bought her tickets to the Nickelback concert, and uh, you know I sat through a Nickelback set, and and something happened that really pissed me off. Besides the fact that I was watching Nickelback, I was standing next to like a guy that was older than me and his family. I think you know this is like a uh, Wachovia Center show, uh, now Wells Fargo Center in Philly. And the, and Nickelback covered uh, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting by Elton John. That was on their one album. Okay. Well, they they played it live. Wait, how do you know that? I used to work in a place that played CDs nonstop, oh, okay. so I would have to listen to Nickelback every once all in a right. while. So they're playing Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, and I'm kind of grooving. I'm like, all right, I know this song, whatever. And I'm kind of bobbing my head, and the guy turns around to me. He's like, all right, young guy behind me. It's like, that's an Elton John song. <laughs> and I remember getting so pissed off, like, no shit, it's an Elton John song. It's the but he, only song I'm into tonight. But he was so, like, I could just tell he was so proud of himself for learning me that, you know, this was an Elton John song, not a Nickelback song. And he drove out of the parking lot of that concert probably like, yeah, I told that young guy that that was Elton John, and, you know, he's going to he's gonna thank me for that one day, you know. Yeah. And there was not yeah. one attractive person at that concert. Oh, no. I, I can't imagine there would be. So, All right, Dave. Um, we usually close out our uh, interviews here by doing uh, something from the Book of Questions. Okay? All right. We've got 200 questions in this book. Uh, some of them are pretty dark, and I'd like you to pick a number between 1 and 200, and I will read you the corresponding question. 86. All right. I'm bored. 
Speaking of dark, how do you picture your funeral? Is it important to you to have people to mourn your death? Doesn't get more morbid than that question. Uh, you know what? I went through a phase where I watched Murder Channel nonstop. I don't even know the name of the real channel. It's just a channel that's nonstop, like Dateline, murder, mystery chant things. So I think about getting murdered all the time. Oh, God. Uh, I get sad when I think about, like, my kids and my girlfriend being sad. I don't really care, like, about the rest. I kind of want it to be a get-together. Like, my friends don't get together all that much. So, like, I don't... I, yeah, come see my thing, whatever, or watch me go on the ground. But then I just want them to go out and eat pizza and drink and just hang out for a little bit. And uh, not so much mourn me, but just share stories. Even if I'm not in them, like, just reminisce. Like, that's... I, I wanted to bring my friends in a place. Because right now, the only thing that brings us together are weddings. So I guess my death can fill in for that. Right. Dave, that was a great answer. I, I don't know how I would have answered that question. I probably would have been like, well, yeah, man, I want, like, 150 people at my funeral mourning me, you know, something, like, totally self-centered. But that was the best... That was the best kind of answer you could give to that question. I like my friends. <laughs> right on. All right, well, Dave, uh... Give me some of your URLs for people to check out. Uh, you can find everything at DaveBasella.com. That's uh, B-I-S-C-E-L-L-A. I'm on Twitter at Dave Basella. Uh, Eric and Dave is EricandDave.com. That's Eric and Dave talking with Eric and Dave. And I do a movies podcast called uh, Movies on Up. That's just MoviesOnUp.com. But you can get to all that through DaveBasella.com if you want to. Right on. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it again on such short notice. And thank oh, you problem. for your help in getting this podcast up and running. I like helping out. Yeah. I mean, like I thought I was going to have to pay like 15 bucks a month or something for some service. But in 2012, it's not that hard to get a podcast up. So. Not at all. And, but, but people think it is. People think it's like difficult. We won't tell them. It's not. Right. It's not like there's not already 20 million already. But all right, that's fun. 